the four horsemen of the apocalypse, death, disease, famine, destruction, martyrs crying out for justice, earthquakes, tremors, the falling of the sky, the end of the world, and at the very end of it all, who can stand? If this is your first time in church, you're like, oh, they're actually crazy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, th- th- we're, we're in the middle of a series right now through the book of Revelation, arguably one of the most important books in the Bible, and also definitely the most misunderstood and misrepresented. Um, We are now, as of today, diving into like the the kind of the trickier parts of the book. The part where either some of us would be inclined to try and like dive in and and view it as like a a cryptic puzzle to be solved. And then the rest of us kind of just throw it out. It's like, this is ridiculous. And we put it into the category of Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, or the House of the Dragon. We we, we put it off as, as fantasy. And... Um, it's an interesting part of Revelation because, like, this is actually where we start getting into some, some really significant messages. But most of us don't know what to do with it. Um, how many of you have read chapter 6 of Revelation before coming today? A decent amount of hands. So you know, like, and we just read it. It's, it's a complex passage. It starts off with these, these four horsemen and these first four seals. And I think when we come to content like this, there is a temptation to view it as a puzzle or to throw it out altogether. But the problem is is that both of these things fail to miss the greater message of what's going on beneath the surface that's actually incredibly valuable to us. Um, the, the, The book of Revelation is a type of literature which we don't really have anymore today. But 2,000 years ago, this kind of literature was called apocalyptic literature. And it's literature that that tries to kind of appeal to our senses, to go beyond simply stating it as it is, but state it in pictures and metaphors in order for us to be able to grasp a concept at a level of which words themselves could simply not do it justice. Um, How many of you still read the newspaper? Not not too many hands, a few. Um, How many of you remember old, like, political comics that used to be in the newspaper? Quite a few more hands. Like, even you can picture, like, the, uh, the, the large elephant sitting on top of a house representing debt that is crushing the house. It's like a political comic. We know that what it's trying to communicate is not that there's a whole bunch of elephants deciding that they're going to walk into New York City and stand on all the houses. We know that's not going on. We know it's, it's a symbol that's trying to communicate something in a way that it engages with our mind in a way that simply words do not. And Revelation is very similar to that. It is trying to communicate to us in a way that goes beyond just simply using words to describe something. The things in Revelation require more than just words. They require imagery and imagination to be able to wrestle with and grapple with the truth of what's going on. Revelation itself, it means, the, the word revelation means, uh, it's, it comes from the word apocalypsis which is where we get the word apocalypse from, which simply means not the end of the world. It means the unveiling. It means the revealing of what has not been seen. And what Revelation is trying to do is it's trying to help us see that things are not as they seem. And so even the section we're diving into today is trying to highlight for us certain things that are not as they seem. It's the message of the book of Revelation. So if you're new and tracking with us, we are about to jump into a little bit heavier of a portion of the book. And I'm going to try and explain it, but I'm going to, we're not going to get way into the weeds. We can save that for, for our own personal study. But if you remember the last few weeks, John, who is this, this man who has had this, this vision, and, and in chapter 4 and 5, he has this vision into heaven. He sees into the throne room of God. And there's these creatures and these and elders and angels that are all sitting around the throne worshiping God. And there's this portion in this scene where there's a scroll. And the scroll holds God's plan for the world. His plan to bring redemption and to bring justice to the world. And this scroll is bound by seven seals. 
And it says that no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was worthy to open the scroll. And upon hearing this, John, the, the man seeing this vision, he begins to weep because he so desires to see how, how is God going to come and restore justice to the world. And no one is worthy. But then one of the elders says to John, he says, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then John turns, and what's he see? A lamb. John turns, he, it says, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he turns, and he doesn't see a lion, he sees a lamb. And what's true of the lamb? It's been slain. So John turns and he sees this lamb standing as though it had been slain or slaughtered. And this lamb is worthy to open the scroll. And what's interesting, we talked about this over the last few weeks, is that the lamb was not worthy because of being a lamb. It's not because he was a lamb that he was worthy to open it. It's because it was the lamb who was slain. It's because of what he did that made him worthy. The lamb that was slain represents Jesus. When Jesus died, he was slain. He was bloodied upon the cross to take your sin and my sin so that we can step into a relationship with God. Because Jesus has defeated sin in the grave, resurrected into new life, and now his power lives within us, because of all that was accomplished on the cross, that Jesus, that lamb, is made worthy to open the scroll. And so now today we start, and this will be we, a few, the next while, of looking at what is actually the contents of the scroll. And we start off by seeing the content of the seals. So we're going to deep dive this for a little bit and then we'll, we'll get practical. Seal number one, verse one of chapter six. Now I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. Its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. He came conquering and to conquer. First and foremost, one thing to note that might not be obvious on the surface is it says that it's the one, there is one seated on a horse. And is this seated upon is like the same wording in the, in, the, in the Greek that is the wording when it says the one seated on the throne. And now this rider and this horse, it's, it's, it's evil, but it's an evil like kind of looking a little bit like God. And some of you have had experiences where it seemed like evil sat on the throne. It seemed like, like evil was kind of was, was in control. It was having its way. But the, this is not what's going on here so much as it is the one sitting is, is a direct parallel to the description of God sitting on the throne. This rider represents humankind setting themselves up in the place of God. It's, 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 and, and then this whole picture of this horse and this rider, it's, it's, it's a reference to the general propensity of sinful humans to lust after conquest. It says he came to conquer, uh, to, came conquering and to conquer. The purpose of this figure, if we sum it down, is military conquest. This figure represents humanity's lust for conquest. But before we move on, I think there's a few things that are important for us to highlight. And this is the only time we're going to get kind of into the weeds a little bit. First and foremost, it says, one of the creatures says, come. And what's, what's happening there? There's three kind of main views, and I think we can actually uh, afford some time to, to touch on what each of them are. The first view is that the creature saying, come Lord Jesus, usher in your kingdom of God. Because there is a reality, as the kingdom of God moves in, there will be increasing measure of opposition to the kingdom of God. As the kingdom of God moves in, the things that are against the kingdom of God will become more revealed. So that's one of the views, is that, that he's saying, come Lord Jesus, establish your kingdom in greater measure. And then this is, the, the, the horsemen are what follows that. They're the consequence of that, in a sense. The resistance. Another view is that when he's saying, come, it's, it's saying, come to the, to the rider and the horse. It's basically saying, come evil, evil do your worst. Reveal yourself for who you truly are. It's this, it's this, it's, it's this call for sin to make itself known. That the outcome of human sin would be revealed and be made clear. 
And then lastly, some would argue that, that, that come, and some, some even versions of the Bible would translate this, come and see. And it's actually saying to John, John, come and see what is going to take place. Come and see evil unleashed. Come and see the trajectory of human sin when it's carried out to its fullness. And no matter how we interpret that word, we can, all three of them, point to this idea that evil is being revealed for what it truly is. It is showing the trajectory of human sinfulness. One of the... uh, commentaries I was reading put it this way it seems likely that this is not just judgment that is being poured out rather God is allowing human depravity to come full circle and so this is this is like so in in one sense like it is like it's God that's that's causing these things to be initiated but it's, it's the revealing of sin It's this whole idea that sin, if not checked when it's young, will grow into something worse and worse as time goes on. We we sometimes like to think of some of our sin as being passive. It's like it's not really harming me, it's not really harming anybody else, and so as long as it kind of just stays here in this little box, it's all right. The belief that that is not going somewhere is a lie. All sin is on a trajectory. And sin, if not dealt with, ultimately leads to death. And these four horsemen show us where sin ultimately leads. This can even happen intergenerationally. If there is a, a father who has a struggle, that can, and that's not dealt with, it'll be handed down to the, to the child. Some of us have seen this happen. And if it doesn't get dealt with there, it'll be handed on, and it'll get worse and worse throughout generations. There is always an opportunity to stop it, to cut it, to remove the sin from our lives. But when sin is left undealt with, it will increase over time. It's just a reality of sin. So in this this first portion of chapter 6 of Revelation, we are seeing sin is being unveiled for what it truly is. Sin is being shown, the trajectory of sin is being shown to us clearly. And we'll keep talking about this a little bit as we go. Seal number two. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. So the first seal, the first horseman and rider represents humanity's lust for conquest. This next rider and horse represents bloodshed. The Romans would have had this idea called the right of the sword. It's basically one's authority to kill. And so the second rider represents humanity's ability and and act of killing one another. So the first horseman represents humanity's lust for conquest. The second horseman represents humanity's desire and ability to kill one another. The third seal, verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And his rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and wine. The first two seals are about war. You could argue that the second two are, in a sense, the result of war. This whole thing of a denarius, a denarius is a day's wages. And a quart of wheat was essentially enough to feed one person for a day. We're getting this picture that there's scarcity, that a day's wages for a man is only going to cover enough food for them, not enough to provide for their family. And so any families with young kids, it's like they're not able to provide. There's actually not enough to go around. But then it says, don't harm the oil and wine, which are often viewed as more of like the, the, the rich people things. And there's this idea that there's famine, there's scarcity, but then there's also like social inequality, economic inequality. The poor get poorer and the rich get richer. It's this, this, this tension that comes out in, 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 in the midst of war and destruction. There becomes famine and scarcity. And that's the third seal. Seal number four. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. This, is, this horse's color is the color of disease. 
It says death and Hades. Hades is like the, the place of the grave. And the word death here can also be translated pestilence. So it's like pestilence and death, sickness and death, disease and death in the fourth seal. So we have humanity's lust for conquest and power. We have humanity's desire and ability to kill and shed blood. We have famine and scarcity, which leads humanity to, to not be kind to one another, for, to create social divides. And then we have disease and death. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, as many would like to call them. So what's going on here? A strange little section of scripture. But we are seeing the trajectory of human depravity. Human sin given over to its own devices. When God steps back and says, I'm no longer going to intervene. You just do what you do. Reveal yourself for who you truly are. This is the result that we get. And the last part of of verse 8, it says, And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. This is like a, likely a summary of the four. So why is this going on? Why is God causing these, these events to unfold? You can view it like this. You can picture a courtroom scene where there's one who's being accused and there's a sentence that needs to be carried out. But a just sentence cannot be carried out until the wrongs of the individual have been fully put on display. It requires the truth of what has been going on, the truth of the evil, to be made evident. Then justice can take place. There's an order to this. So sin is being revealed so that then it can be dealt with. Another way of looking at this is when a doctor needs to make a diagnosis for an illness, it is hard to diagnose an illness that you cannot see. In order to deal with a sickness, the sickness has to be made known. And so the first four seals that are revealed, it's sin being revealed so that it can be dealt with. But for for us, there's like a deeper layer here. Because I don't think any of us are planning on invading another country anytime soon. I don't think lust for conquest is anything that we have like actively on our minds. But what it's talking about is that this is ultimately where sin leads. And maybe not in your life, but unchecked gener- generationally later when it's unbridled, when, it, when sin never gets checked or stopped at any point, this is where it ultimately leads. The reason why God cares so much about sin is because God knows better than we do the destructive nature of where sin will lead us. When God is angry with the world, he's angry because he sees the destructive power of sin that we are so often naive to. I am often naive to the destructive power of sin in my own life until it's too late. I often am not the first to recognize patterns that are getting away from me. It often takes somebody on the outside to help me see it. And what Revelation is doing, it's highlighting, it's revealing, it's unveiling the reality of sin that we so often reject and try not to think about. It's making it obvious and plain. Seal number five. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants, their brothers, should be complete, who are to be killed as they themselves had been. Again, there's tons that we can unpack there. We could spend hours here. But Jesus in, in Mark talks about, he warns his disciples to expect persecution and death. There is a reality that following Jesus requires us to be willing to give it all up. 
Jesus does not trick us into thinking following him will mean something. He's actually quite upfront about the negative things that can come with that. But, but the flip side of that is that God is also a just God. It's interesting that these martyrs, these saints who have been killed, whose blood is under the altar, who have, in a sense, like been sacrificed in the same way that Jesus was sacrificed and slaughtered, their blood, like it cries out, but they don't say, God will you. They know God's character. It's why it says, it's why it says, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long? They're not asking if, they're just asking when. They know that it's in God's nature. God will not let sin go undealt with. Sin is far too destructive to not be dealt with. God is a just God. He will deal with sin. Their question is simply, God, how long? Like, can't you do it now? And God does respond. He gives them a white robe. White robes represent all kinds of things. It's it's the reward for their faithfulness. It's in a sense it's symbolic of their coming vindication. White refers to purity. It refers to salvation in the eyes of the Lord. Salvation in the presence of God. And And it represents purity to be able to stand before the throne of God. And I think we can pause here for a second because, again, under the surface, there's a contrast being drawn out here. Because we are seeing two trajectories at play. We, we, in the first four seals, we see the trajectory of sin, which is, in a, in a sense, it's the trajectory of rejection of God. Because sin is simply getting off of the path that God would have us on. Sin is, in its essence, the rejection of God's plan. So there is, there is God and faithfulness to Jesus, or there's unfaithfulness. And we see the trajectory of sin leads to death, leads to destruction, leads to complete human depravity. But then what's interesting is then, but we also see this picture of like, what does it look like to be faithful to the Lamb? Well, faithfulness seems to result in death. And there's a significance here of like, there's no real middle ground. There's not really any room for for passivity. It's this contrast of like the way of the beast of Babylon, of all these images that represent evil throughout Revelation. It's, It's like it's that or it's faithfulness to the Lamb. We see these trajectories. And it's to not recognize the trajectory of where those take us. It's to not understand the gravity and the significance and the importance of wrestling this at a deep level. The sixth seal. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain uh, mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich and the powerful... And everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who can stand? This imagery is all symbolic of judgment and the end of the world. And a fun little kind of like tidbit is that in Mark 1, if you remember, when, when Jesus gets baptized and then the, and God speaks, it says that the sky was opened. And it's interesting, right at the beginning of, of God instituting or, or bringing his kingdom to earth, when he starts the process of bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, the sky opens. And then in like the culmination of the kingdom of coming to earth, in the end of it all, it ends with the sky, again, in a sense, opening. 
that the kingdom of God begins and is brought to culmination with the opening of the sky. And you can imagine like this kind of this imagery. It's like this is kind of meant to be terrifying imagery of the end of the world. It's meant to, to kind of strike a sense of significance. But what this seal is doing is the seal begins. And again, there's this element of like everything that we're talking about. Like even like the, the evil that we're talking about is all like there's some truth to it now. We see it in our world today. We know that there's, there's saints that have been slain for following Jesus. That's happened throughout history. Those things are true. But then there's a sense throughout Revelation that these things will increase over time. That they're true now. They were true then. And they'll be even more true in the future. But this sixth seal, it begins the fulfillment of God's promise to avenge those who have been slain. To bring justice to where there's been injustice. To deal with evil to rid the world of sin and death, to restore justice to the face of the earth. See, I think sometimes some of us struggle, myself included, sometimes with this idea of God's judgment. It's like, I want God to be friendly. I don't want to think about God's judgment. I like to think about God providing for me and doing things for me and being there with me. I don't like thinking about God's judgment. But can you imagine being the people that are reading this for the first time? where they're in, they're in a cultural setting that is opposed to them, where they have had, many of them have had family members killed for what they believe. If you had had family members killed for what they believe, simply for following Jesus, having done nothing wrong, I imagine we also would be calling out for God to bring some justice. We all have something in us that when something unjust happens, We all have seen stories, even on the news, where somebody who wasn't deserving of something evil experienced something evil, and we all get inside of us the sense that justice needs to happen. We all have this sense of justice. And when it comes to God, God is, God is, God put that in you. That is a, like, we are made in the image of God. One of the things that makes us made in the image of God is that we have a sense of justice. And God is not like up there like angry at everybody. He's not up there wanting to rid the world of all its people. God is up there wanting to deal and rid the world of sin. Because God understands the destructive consequence of sin far better than we can ever grasp it. And so at the very end of Revelation chapter 6, we're posed with this question. When God comes on the scene, this question of who can stand. And all throughout the Old Testament, this language appears over and over again. One example of this is in Malachi chapter 3 as the band comes up. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. What is a refiner's fire? It's the fire that burns away impurity. Within a metal, if there's impurity within a metal, like going into the fire is a pretty negative thing. You're going to be burned. But for gold or the things that are meant to go into the fire, that are prepared to go into the fire, it actually makes them more beautiful. But when we bind ourselves to sin, in a sense we're binding ourselves to the impurity that needs to be, that needs to be burned. The invitation of the gospel is that we no longer actually have to be bound to sin. That we can separate ourselves from sin through faithfulness to the Lamb. We can separate ourselves from sin by choosing to follow Jesus. We can separate ourselves from sin by recognizing that Jesus has taken my sin. By recognizing that Jesus has already dealt with it. I leave it with Him. But there's a warning in this of like, Don't bind yourself to your sin, because this is where it goes. This is the trajectory that it's on. Break yourself off from it. Deal with it. Nip it in the bud. Cut it down early and follow the lamb. And again, this question of who can stand, I think think we all kind of build up reasons within ourselves, like ways that make us feel secure, things that that help us to feel... um, good about this question. Things that that form in us a sense of security. 
It's interesting that in verse 15, it talks about the kings. Those who have like positions of power, who are in authority. I imagine they felt fairly secure. Their means of creating their own survival in their own lives was, was a means that came from position and power. But then it says like the generals and the rich and the powerful. It's like those who have acquired for themselves wealth and possessions and created a security for themselves. Like, like they, they've kind of, they've got it all figured out. They're, they've created for themselves a sense of security. And then it says, and everyone, slave and free. We all have our, our ways of, of like going about our life that try and like, kind of like, it's like, I got to survive. So what are all the things I need to do to survive? What are all the things I need to do in order to feel secure? And, and we have this list of people that have tried that. The kings and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and the slave and the free all had their different means of how they created for themselves a sense of security. And yet they called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. It's almost as if those who had the most reason to think they had ground to stand on were the first to realize that there was nothing there. There's something really interesting in the language that's used because in, verse, in chapter 5 it talks about the lamb, but it says that there was a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Standing as though it had been slain. The lamb that was slain is now standing in the presence of the one who sits on the throne. And we have this picture of the saints who have been slain crying out from beneath the altar. And yet we know that in the end, the ones who were slain for faithfulness to Jesus are the one who in the end will stand. So who will stand? It's those who have chosen to follow the Lamb. But what's in contrast with that? Because sometimes sin takes on all kinds of forms. And again, I don't want you to think of as sin is just like the bad things that you do. Sin is like the being off track from God. Being not on the same page. And I think this question of, of survival is actually important for us to wrestle with. We know in the New Testament there's times where Jesus says, He who wants to save his life must lose it. And he... He, or, yeah, however that goes. He who loses his life will gain it. And this is, it's this upside down nature to the kingdom of God. That the things I hold on to too tightly, I will lose. And the things that I am open handed with, in some sense, I will gain. The thing that we need to prepare ourselves for, that we need to wrestle with, is that that the consequences of sin and death, like throughout the world, the consequences of sin affect everybody. They affect you and me, and they affect the people that are walking in it. The destructive nature of sin affects all of us. But we have an invitation to step into a relationship with the Lamb. We just have to be prepared for what that might mean. Because when I step into faithfulness with the Lamb, I'm not simply making a statement. I am making a decision that I'm going to trust him with my security and my survival. That in the, in the end, it might look like I have nothing to stand on from a world point of view. But if I'm standing with the lamb, in the end, I will stand. But if I am standing on all of the things that I have built for myself, if I'm standing on all of the things that the world around me tells me that I need, in the end, I will fall. And it actually takes some wrestling with this at a deep level, because like, what does this mean practically? We can start filtering, like, how often do I make decisions based on trying to provide for myself my own survival? If you were to look at my bank account, does my bank account reflect that I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, or does it reflect that I'm just trying to survive? 
When you look at the way that I spend my time, does it look like I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Does it look like I stand with the lamb and trust him with everything? Or does it look like I'm living for my own survival? In the way I relate to other people, in the friends that I have, in the reputation that I try to build, does it look like I'm standing with the lamb or I'm trying to create my own survival? In the way that I talk about what I believe, in the way that I, I talk about the lamb who I follow, in the way that I make decisions, in what I say yes and no to, in how I spend my time, all of it can kind of hint and reveal do I actually trust God with my survival and my security? Do I actually trust the Lamb? Do I, when push comes to shove, in the end when all is revealed, am I actually standing with the Lamb? Does my life reflect it? And it's, it's like a difficult thing to wrestle with because I think a lot of us, if we're being honest, it's like, I actually, I think, I think there's some things in my life that maybe don't reflect that I'm standing with the Lamb. There's been some times where maybe I have been living for my own survival and that has, that has been the primary motivator of my decisions. But there's good news in all of this too. Because the step towards following the Lamb, being faithful to the Lamb, which is, which is this other language for, for, for basically stepping into the kingdom of God, for saying, Jesus, yes, I know you, you died for me. You carried my sin. I am no longer bound to sin because of what you've done. I am no longer a slave to sin because you broke that on my behalf. Jesus, you've accomplished all of it. And I can trust you because you've already proven that you're trustworthy. And so I know that, at Jesus, if I'm standing with you, I don't need any of that. Jesus, if I'm standing with you, it's because I trust that you're concerned about me. That you hold my, like, that I can be secure in you. Revelation is meant to, to help us see that maybe there are things under the surface that aren't as they seem. Revelation helps us to see that there is greater consequence and also like greater reward. I think sometimes we like to kind of just live in like the passive middle. Revelation would have us see that the passive middle doesn't actually exist. Everything that we do, every action it puts us on a trajectory towards sin and death or it's a trajectory towards faithfulness to the Lamb. And Jesus invites us all in so that in the end, when all is revealed, we can know that we stand with the Lamb. So that's the invitation for us today. Are we willing to take sin seriously? Are we willing to just like nip it in the bud now because I want no part of it? And Jesus, I'm going to trust you with my family. I'm going to trust you with my finances. I'm going to trust you with the trajectory of my life. I'm going to trust you with my life itself. Because even if I am slain, in the end I will stand. And if I, I have all the riches of the world, all of what the world has to offer, no matter how great I can make this little box of my life today, I know that in the end, it will all be blown away. When all is revealed, I want to be found standing with the Lamb. Jesus, thank you for your invitation. Thank you for your word that reveals this to us before we face it, that we can have a glimpse to see what is coming and not so much just coming as in just like the end times but but like the trajectory that we're on jesus thank you that you take the things that we can't always see clearly and you make them clear to us god i pray that right now in this room that you would reveal to us the current trajectory of our lives and if there are things that are leading us to destruction god would you reveal that and would you break that power in our life that we would be able to step into freedom with you Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you that you invite all of us in. Thank you that there, are, there is nobody that is too far from you to enter in to relationship with you. Thank you that there is no evil that we could ever have done that prevents us from stepping in and saying, yes, I choose to be faithful to the Lamb. 
that's available to all of us. And we thank you for that today. But God, I pray that today you would convict us, convict us, convict us of our sin, but you would give us a hope and an optimism for what it looks like to live life with you. Thank you for your word in Jesus' name.